Hello, everyone. Chris here again. Uh, I just did an article, um, so I'm going to do another one. Uh, and I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of it, but what matters is that we're reading it and that we're trying. Uh, Zanel Muhali's, Muholi, Muhali, uh, Muhali's Intimate Archive, Photography in Post-Apartheid Lesbian Lives. Looks, this, looks like this is from the journal Safundi, S-A-F-U-N-D-I. Um, there's the citation, here's the link to the article. I'll try to put that in the description this time because, um, yeah, the last video I didn't put it in the description, but I think it was a whole book the last time. I was just reading a chapter out of it, but since this is a DOI, I think I might include it in the description of this video so that you can see it uh, if, you, if anybody's watching it. So I'm going to go ahead and just get started. This is by Kylie Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, October 2010. The ones who fear me think they know who I am. That's a quote from Minnie Bruce Pratt. This paper focuses on the work of South African Black lesbian photographer Zanel Muholi and raises the question of how experience that is deemed unspeakable can enter representation. We always read images through codes of connotation, through what Roland Barthes terms the stadium of our knowing. How is it possible to overturn ways of seeing that render lesbian subjectivity invisible? And if lesbian subjectivity is made visible through suspending the structures of recognition, what are the political implications of occupying such an outlaw position? How does being beyond recognition open or close the field of political possibility? The paper makes two theoretical claims. One, that Bard's influential concept of the punctum can be understood as a mode of queer reading. And two, that Muholi's work constructs an archive that insists on the specificity of lesbian lives and loss through a complex strategy of passing. My reading of Muholi's portraits that constitute her Faces and Phases series explores how her photographs work with the ambiguities of passing, passing away, passing between states of gendered being, and passing through the prohibitions against making lesbian experience visible and mourning lesbian loss. In this way, the paper argues that Muholi's most recent body of work queers both the conventions of memorial photography and her own earlier representations of lesbian subjectivity. Zanel Muholi is one of a handful of Black women artists who figure predominantly in the visual art field, and her work has been shown both in South Africa and abroad. She is certainly the most visible Black lesbian artist in South Africa and has received numerous awards for her work. Her photographs have also generated a great deal of controversy. In August 2009, South Africa's Minister of Arts and Culture, Lulu Chingwana, walked out of an exhibition that contained several of Muholi's photographs on the grounds that they were immoral, offensive, and worked against nation building. This has placed Muholi's photographs at the center of a national debate about homophobia, freedom of expression, and queer experience. I will return to the significance of Xing Huana's comments later in this paper in my discussion of the tactics Muholi employs on her photographs of Black lesbians who have been subject to corrective rape and who have died of AIDS-related causes or who were murdered as a result of hate crimes. I read these images. I read these images. Read, read? It's hard to say. R-E-A-D. I read these images as works of mourning that invoke conventional tropes of memorialization to circumvent precisely the socially normative prohibitions so dramatically performed by Xing Wana in her role as an authorized voice of the state. The paper offers an analysis of the transformation in Moholi's mode of working that occurs when she addresses the question of how to represent loss. In particular, I trace how our current work draws on the conventions of memorial photography in order to secure a place for queer subjects within representation. At the same time, I show how this complex working with and against the structures of recognition signals a departure from her earlier and more narrow conceptualizations of lesbian subjectivity. In order to do this, I begin by describing some of the ways in which her photographs can be understood as engaged in the task of differencing the canon before turning to a reading of her most recent series of portraits, Faces and Phases. The work of South African feminist theorists Desiree Lewis and Puma, Pumla Dineo Gikola Kola, and curator and artist Gabi Nikobo has drawn attention to how Muholi's photographs render visible the complexity of lesbian lives. However, this brave and politically necessary task is not the sum of her work. The import of her current photographs lies in how they lay, how they both lay bare and contest 
the ways in which the lives of queer subjects are made invisible and their deaths ungrievable. Faces and Phases, I argue here, works at the limit of the speakable, and Maholi's photographs mark that limit even as they pass beyond it, disrupting visual codes. In Encounters in the Virtual Feminist Museum, Grisella Pollock Griselle de Pollock presents an approach to the history of art that embarks on the work of what she terms differencing the canon. She swiftly lays to rest the notion that the canon is quite differenced enough already by noting that not only have we had to struggle and still struggle on to ensure equity in the representation of all women as well as all men in our cultural archives, but now our very struggle is being written out of history, brushed off as a passing irritant. Pollock begins her reflections on the place of women in the history of art, in the museum, and in the archive, by relating her encounter with a series of postcards that depict the Three Graces, a neoclassical sculpture by Antonio Canova. She notes how the prevalence of the female nude in the art museum is so naturalized that we no longer see its strangeness. And as long standing, and as long-standing signifier of Western art, the naked female form becomes a placeholder for women in art. The place of a woman in the museum, a stony limit point for feminist art practice in theory. Her book goes on to produce a virtual feminist museum through a constellation of images exhibited in what she terms rooms at the beginning of each of her chapters, all of which unsettle and recalibrate the archive of our history. Pollock's work reminds us that archives matter. What is included shapes forever what we think we were, and hence what we might become. The absence of women's histories in world archives has defined a vision of the human on the pattern of a privileged masculinity. I think I'm gonna take that quote uh, and write about it. Pollock's approach to reconfiguring how we think about visual culture is suggestive, and her archival feminist aim resonates with the work of Zanel Muholi in several ways. Muholi's project is also an archival one, and is concerned with many of the same issues of visibility and invisibility that have consumed feminist scholarship since the 1970s. In her artist's statement that appears in the catalog for the Innovative Women exhibition, she writes, as an insider within the Black lesbian community and a visual activist, I want to ensure that my community, especially those lesbian women who come from the marginalized townships, are included in the women's canon. I think I'm going to pause here. Okay, uh, yeah, I read all this and then I paused it here because I pulled out this quote about privileged masculinity. Um, like what did I have to say regarding that? Uh, I, like to, I basically talked about how like, if all we have in the archive are depictions of men, then it might lead some people who have absolutely no idea like what the archive is and what it's about I just used aliens as an example. Like, what if aliens came down to our planet? They went to a museum, they looked at an archive, and all they saw were dudes. And they're like, okay, so the humans asexually reproduce, right? Like, unless there's a record of it happening. And here's the thing with the Comstock Act, where like you're not allowed to send uh, pornographic material over the mail, um, it kind of uh, people aren't allowed to talk about things when you sort of shut it down like that. I guess that's my point there. So, um, yeah, our archives matter. Um, I think that's what this point basically is in this paragraph. So moving on, a cursory survey of Muholi's work thus far reveals the intensity of her commitment to producing a visual archive of Black lesbian experience. Her photographs have appeared in group exhibitions since 2002. Her solo exhibition, Visual Sexuality, was held at the Johannesburg Art Gallery in 2004. And since 2006, she's been represented by Michael Stevenson, a commercial art gallery in South Africa. I was actually looking at it um, when I had the recording paused. Interesting stuff. Uh, let's see here. She has held four additional solo exhibitions there. Only half the picture, 2006, being 2007, Faces and Phases, uh, first, exhibited, first exhibited in a series in 2009, and in Dao Yami, 2010. Her exhibitions in Europe and North America include solo shows in Vienna and Amsterdam. In 2007, together with a white South African lesbian photographer, Jean Brundrit, Maholi facilitated a series of photographic workshops to gather diverse opinions and diverse lesbian experiences in South Africa with eight aspiring photographers. While the artist is now firmly positioned within the commercial art world, she continues her work within the Forum for the Empowerment of Women, an organization that she co-founded 
and to teach others to take photographs. As this paper shows, she bounds, the bounds of her photographic archive have expanded to include representations of multiple forms of queer subjectivity. Muholi's photographs open new spaces of representation in South African visual culture, but follow in the tradition of feminist lesbian art making practices established over time by artists such as the US based Judy Chicago, Cindy Sherman, Laura Aguilar, and others. In her over, over, O E U V R E. Let's, let, let's, let's learn together what that word is. The works of a painter, composer, or author. How do you say that? Ouvre. 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 Okay. Sorry, I'm having fun. Ouvre. In her oeuvre, these are numerous works uh, that proclaim their transgressive, disruptive stance. And these are perhaps the images that are easiest to categorize, easiest to dismiss as some critics have, as not very good art that nonetheless makes an important political point. Some of the images in Maholi's book only have the picture and some that appear in her more recent Being series are among those that invoke conventional tropes of lesbian feminist representation to contest the bounds of what is considered proper for women and for art. Interesting. Dada, 2003, a black and white photograph of a bare-breasted black woman strapping on a dildo, her face beyond the frame of the image, the 2005-6 period series and the 2009 Wise of series can all be read as testing the limits of propriety in art and as a straightforward claiming of a visual space for embodied Black lesbian experience. And through these works, Muholi's project can be said to be aligned with the mainstream feminist position that Pollock articulates in Encounters in the Virtual Feminist Museum. For in this conceptualization of the production of a new form of feminist archive, that makes the experiences of women visible. It is of course necessary that the women who are represented are recognizable as women. Muholi's project, one that she articulates on her website as mapping and archiving a visual history of black lesbians in post-apartheid South Africa also engages and affirms a particular form of identity politics in order to lay claim to a place within an existing order of representation. Very interesting. At the same time, Maholi's concern with securing a place for lesbian experience within the women's canon signals that what constitutes lesbian subjectivity is by no means decided. Her works testify to the ontological insecurity of the category of being that is lesbian in a context where corrective rape is practiced as a way to restore lesbians to womanhood. Oh boy, here we go. That, I didn't need to read that. The ontological insecurity of the category of being that is lesbian in a context where corrective rape is practiced as a way to restore lesbians to womanhood. That, uh, that, that's too much. That's, that's not cool. Um, bringing the work of Zanel Moholy into conversation with the feminist position that Pollock articulates also opens a way to consider what the limits of differencing the canon might be. What happens when radical and disruptive forms of subjectivity seek to enter representation? What does the canon hold? Does the archive seize up, prohibit entry? What kinds of silences remain? Afterlife. Reading photographic images are what the minister thought he saw at the show. Roland Barth says photographic connotation, like every well-structured signification, is an institutional activity in relation to society overall. Its function is to integrate man to reassure him. Hmm. Interesting use of the word man there. Or people, you know, to, to integrate people. Uh, Lulu Xinghua Na says, in August last year, I was invited to speak at the Innovative Women art exhibition at Constitution Hill. Upon arrival of the exhibition, I, was immediately, I immediately saw images which I deemed offensive. The images in large frames were of naked bodies, presumably involved in sexual acts. I was particularly revolted by an image called self-rape, depicting a sexual act with a nature scene as a backdrop. The notion of self-rape trivializes the scourge of rape in this country. To my mind, these were not works of art, but crude misrepresentations of women, both black and white, masquerading as artworks rather than engaged in questioning or interrogating, which I believe is what art is about. Those particular works of art stereotyped black women. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause here and see if I can find that because I didn't see that one when I looked at the gallery. All right, so the only, like, the only artwork I saw that was even close to that, it said self and this. So, okay, so like when I looked at the gallery to try to find it, I did not find it there. So maybe this was a different artistic work in a different exhibition she had, and not the one I'm thinking of with, um, what was this guy's name? I just read it. 
think it was at the bottom of this page here. Yeah, this one, Michael Stevenson. Um, so I don't know if that's the newest one. And I just, because when she said this, I'm like, what? what are you talking about? Because I didn't see it in that gallery, but maybe it's a different gallery. So let's move on. In response to criticism that her departure from the show is homophobic, the Minister of Arts and Culture stated, contrary to media reports, I was not even aware as to whether the bodies in the images were of men or women or both for that matter. There's a strange way in which Xing Wana's comments can be read as particularly insightful. Maholi's photographs do trouble the distinction between men, women, or both for that matter. And there is a powerful sense in which lesbians can only enter recognizable representation as crude misrepresentations of women masquerading as artworks. Xing Wana's act of turning away from the exhibition, her inability to look, also speaks to how certain images might serve to challenge and even overturn the conventions that govern our gaze. Her statements also reveal more than they intend about the challenges we find when we attempt to describe what it is we see, and in particular, when we try to read a photograph. For what emerges is that while Sheen Wana found herself powerfully affected by her brief immersion in the field of Black lesbian visual art, she did not see what she describes, nor is she quite sure of what, she, what it was she saw. In her now classic work on photography, Susan Sontag explores the ubiquity and importance of photographic images in the industrialized countries of the West, where, she argues, life can no longer be imagined without cameras to provide evidence of life itself, and people feel that they are images and, made, and are made real by photographs. Sontag's reflections on the symbolic power the photographic images have come to hold in contemporary society can also be read as an attempt to make sense of photography, to provide an answer to the question, what is a photograph? The photographer both loots and preserves, denounces and consecrates, she writes. And although there is a sense in which the camera does indeed capture reality, not just interpret it, photographs are as much an interpretation of the world as paintings and drawings are. This makes a good point that it, um, a photograph is just a sliver out of time. And so whenever you look at a photograph, it is inherently a lacking context in my opinion so like sometimes we'll have like a the name of it at the bottom or something like that but like what what, what is it doing what is it saying and ultimately i think what they're saying here is that what one person sees is not what the other person sees at least that's my understanding of it while for sontag the force of a photograph is that it keeps open to scrutiny instance which the normal flow of time immediately replaces for roland bards the photographic image is no more outside of time than those who view it for Barthes, photographs do not capture a moment of the real to be seen again and again, but in responding to the image, it is the viewer and the society of which they are part that is laid open to scrutiny. The instant in time the photograph is intended to capture is perceived afterwards, and it is in this aftertime that the significance of the image comes to be constituted. In this sense, photographs do not preserve life, but create it, a perpetual afterlife. And it is in this making that the critical project of constructing a photographic archive of queer experience lies, an archive that testifies to the presence of Black lesbians in the past, but one that asserts and ensures their presence in the future. In his essay, The Photographic Message, Barthes extends and contemplates Sontag's definition of photographs and her analysis of how they can be read. He begins his essay with what he terms the photographic paradox, analogical perfection, the absence of a code that translates the object into its image defines the photograph, which at the same time is a sign of something other than itself. The photograph appears to be a mechanical analog of reality, a denoted message, and to describe it is to attach to the image a connoted message, which is the manner in which the society to a certain extent communicates what it thinks of it. In front of a photograph, the feeling of denotation, or if one prefers, of analogical plentitude, is so great that the description of a photograph is literally impossible. To describe consists precisely in joining to the denoted message a relay or second order message derived from a code, which is that of language and constituting in real language in relation to the photographic analog. However, much care one takes to be exact, a connotation. To describe is thus not simply to be imprecise or incomplete. It is to change structures, to signify something different to what is shown. For bars, then, a photograph is and can only be our reading of it. When we describe what we see, we signify something different to what is shown. And crucially, how one reads is through other images, visible or remembered, alongside and in conjunction with the single image that can never be singular. 
In Camera Lucidia, Barres extends his thinking about photographs, extends his thinking about how photographs are read through the concepts of studium and punctum. Most photographs belong in to the studium, that which I have learned to see by acculturation and that which cannot really reach me. Then there are those photographs that arrest my gaze, photographs that disturb the studium of my knowing, photographs that wound me, photographs that I love. This element within the photograph is animated through, this for, through the particularity of my gaze. It is this that bar this terms the punctum. The second element will break or punctuate the studium. This time it is not I who seek it out as I invest the field of the studium with my sovereign consciousness. It is this element which, ar which rises from the scene, shoots out of it like an arrow and pierces me. Again, we're reminded of Barz's key insight that there is nothing really internal to the image. I read everything I see and can only see what I read. This is not to disavow the relationship between myself and the image. The image wields a certain power by virtue of what it draws out in me. But as I look, the image becomes what I turn it into. My reading structure is the image. I make it mean. Bard's concept of the studium and the punctum set up a method of reading photographs that illuminates how all readings are cultural, but at the same time, legitimate a deeply subjective mode of response. The concept of the punctum allows Bard, not to mention all those who have followed in his wake, to cast his emotional, poetic responses to photographs as a theory. I draw on these concepts here to grant a kind of legitimacy to my readings of Moholy's photographs. At the same time, I'm struck by how thinking of how her work in relation to Barth's influential terms casts light on the implications of queering the gays beyond gay and lesbian studies. In other words, it's not simply that Barth's method offers a productive mode of reading Moholy's photographs, but Moholy's work shows that reading with and for the punctum can be understood as a mode of queer reading, an openness to ways of seeing that disrupt the heteronormative patriarchal hegemony that limits and structures our gaze. In Camera Lucidia, Barth's writes of how to give examples of punctum is in a certain fashion to give myself up, to review the ways in which I am affected by a photograph is to be exposed, describing what I see is an act that outs me, one that positions my intimate self in a public sphere. Giving myself up before a photograph is also to occupy a subject position beyond or outside of my own. Faced with Moholy's, Moholy's portrait of Nomondi Mubusi, for example, I know that I have been set up to see in a certain way. This is the photographer's art. As with so many of her photographs, I face a beautiful image of a beautiful woman. The lines of this young woman's body are carved in light and are accentuated by the dark cloth behind her. Her head is wrapped in a scarf so that only the faintest trace of her hair is visible on her forehead. She appears to be moving toward the viewer. It seems she is about to speak. She is not wearing a shirt, but the photograph is cropped above her breasts. The smooth, open expanse of her skin and her wide eyes are a form of invitation. An erotic photograph. I don't know. The photographic encounter frames my desire. I want to see this woman to hold her with my gaze, and yet she holds me. A kind of Mona Lisa effect comes into play. She seems to move as I do. To be interpolated by Nomondi Babusi's eyes in this way is both liberating and disturbing. Seeing the Holy's photographs is premised on the notion that exchanging queer looks and recognizing the desire they conjure is to acknowledge the queerness inside ourselves. What might the minister have seen had she stayed to look at Muholi's photographs? The incendiary quality of the words Xing Huana did and did not see lies in how they make possible a space for us to acknowledge our own queer desire. I want to argue in how they provide an entry point into an intimate archive, one that is embodied, one that is formed through love. Xing Wana's inability to look returns us to the question of how Moholy's representations of lesbian subjectivity alert us to the limit of the speakable, even as they pass beyond it. Light writing and dark times. Moholy's first monograph, only half the picture, carefully works with the aesthetics of the body, a complex holding of traumatic histories encoded in skin together with a celebration of lesbian desire and the promise of pleasure. Through Maholi's lens, black female bodies are re-signified, framed as the subjects of and for lesbian desire. They make visible an erotics of longing, of sexual intimacy, and of community. At the same time, many of the photographs carry resonances of images of black female bodies drawn from a long history of racist iconography 
and which map the continuities of black female oppression over time. In the cracked toenails of the women in triple three, for instance, there are signs of hardship. In the dark markings along the outer edges of the thighs and the reclining figures, there is a shadow of darkness, of violence, bruises, or stains. Read in conjunction with the other photographs in the triple series that portray the interlocking legs and buttockses of three women, and that bring to mind the erotic nudes of Edward Weston or Imogen Cunningham, the ambiguities of triple three are largely erased, and its erotic dimension comes to the fore comes to the fore. The pose of the three women speaks of the stillness of sleep and shows the protective tenderness of bodies curved around one another. So I would show it to you, but I might be violating YouTube guidelines if I do so, unless I mark this video as for adults. But anyway, um, I'll try to put the link um, of the gallery in the archive so you can see the images that they're talking about. And yet there is something disturbing about the arrangement of these bodies on the floor. They are shown to be resting on a strip of carpet. Its detail in the foreground so close up it becomes a strange terrain and then fades to merge with what appears to be a stone floor that extends behind them. The marks on the limbs of these women evoke the history of slavery. Some in photographs of the bodies of those killed in the Rwand Rwandan genocide provide a visual echo of the legs of schoolgirls who've been tear gassed and who run from the police in Soweto in South Africa in 1976. The larger context in Maholi's book, one that includes photographs of women after being raped, raises the question of how it is possible to read Black lesbian desire outside of the violence of both past and present. I want to say that inside the frame triple three, there is no fear, only kinship, intimacy, love. But if this is so, then fear is just beyond the borders of what is made visible here and haunts this beautiful assemblage of bare forms. Here, as in the works, that form part of her series portraying lesbians who have been subject to hate crimes that I discussed below, Muholi is masterful in her portrayal of the vulnerability of the human body and the complexity of embodied experience. I'm gonna pause here. It's about, it looks like it's about to get pretty heavy here, so trigger warning. In Ordeal 2003, there is a line of fury that runs through the arm of the woman who crouches at the edge of an, an enamel basin scrubbing her hands into a blurred frenzy, moving so fast and so slick with water they appear unskinned. At the center of the photograph, in which everything else remains still, these hands are rendered unrecognizable, a pulpy mass, an integral organ exposed to the air, an internal organ exposed to the air, an aborted fetus or placenta, something that cannot be washed clean. This is the first of a series of photographs in only half the picture that depicts the survivors of hate crimes. It is followed by a double page spread of a case number, a crumbled piece of lined paper depicted against a black ground issued by the South African Police Service in Meadowlands, Soweto. Handwritten on the page are the details of the case, the date of the incident, the name of the inspector assigned to the case, a phone number, and an official stamp. There's also a line that reads, attention, rape plus assault, GBH, grievous bodily harm. The photograph that appears over leaf casts light on why this hastily written case number should be accorded so much space. Hate Crime Survivor 1, 2004, is a closely cropped portrait of a woman visible from her waist to just above her knees. The vertical lines of her hospital-issued pajama pants are angled slightly in towards the center of the photograph and draw the viewer's eyes to her slender wrists and hands, which are positioned on her lap, her curved finger and thumb forming a dark hollow, a point of entry into her body, a metonym for the violated parts of her we cannot see. Around her wrists are three identifi identificatory tags that signify her impatient status, her inpatient status, but here also reads as manacles, handcuffs. And suddenly her striped clothing resembles a prison uniform and the posture of her body holds the echo of countless images of incarcerated men who stand with her head with their heads bent, their hands and feet bound, a stance of guilt. I'm gonna try to find that. I, I found the photo here. Um, I figured I could show you this one because it's pretty tame. There's no, I don't consider any of these images to be pornographic, you know what I mean? But like some of them do show, um, they show vulvas or they show breasts. So I don't, I don't want to get any trouble because of that. And I just think that this, this image is one that I can show you where I don't think anything would come about because of it. But here you can see those identificatory um, tags on their arms so like like it was saying hate crime survivor could be this could be them in prison or it could be them as the survivor of a traumatic sexual experience so 
hard to say, but I think this is what I think the article is talking about is then no two people can look at this picture the same way. Like there's always going to be an infinite number of possibilities of how we can look at it. So anyway, that is, um, that was sort of what I was saying for the end there. So I found it and there it was. The implication is that in spite of the indisputable archival evidence represented by the photograph of the case number that immediately precedes this image, lesbians who are raped are often not believed and are treated as criminals both inside and outside of the justice system. So I think I can show you that one. I'm gonna pause it just, just real quick. So here's the, the photograph of the case number, as you can see. Uh, the date that it happened. Um, what else did they say? Well, anyway, th that's that piece of paper. It, it looks official, but it looks kind of unofficial. Like I see the stamp and everything else, but it looks very much um, like a handwritten type of note type of deal. But anyway, that's how the justice system, <laughs> excuse me. The juxtaposition of these two photographs makes visible the ways in which those who are subject to rape are often, sorry, are also often accused of having brought violence on themselves. That's not good. The concept of corrective or curative rape is often read as premised on the idea that lesbians have done something wrong to begin with, and that rape is that which will set things right, restoring the natural order. I, God, I can't, oh, I can't read this stuff. This hurts. Talk about the punctum. Like I read this shit and it's like, uh, sorry, I read this stuff and it's like, oh, uh, it's not good. Ooh. Moholy articulates how rape is used to punish and correct lesbians in South Africa. Curative rapes, as they are called, are, perpetu are perpetrated against us in order to make us into real and true African women, appropriately feminine mothers, men's property. That makes me sick, man. I can't even read that stuff. Yet, as Muholi's photographs show, understanding the psychic mechanism that underlies curative rape as an act that restores the order of patriarchy through affirming relations of power between men and women is to grant a kind of sense to a senseless acts of hate. Her series depicting survivors of hate crimes shows how the act of curative rape is fundamentally tied to a desire to murder. Uh, one of the most painful photographs in Muholi's oeuvre is Hate Crime Survivor 2. It appears alongside the photograph of the criminal survivor and powerfully undoes the flawed and fatal logic that seeks to blame lesbians who are raped. In a hospital ward on a high bed covered with a white sheet is a figure under a heap of dark bed clothes. In fact, it is the only caption that accompanies the photograph which renders the figure legible without the single line that tells us that what we are looking at is a person, a survivor. There is no way to know for certain that the shape on the bed is a human form. The camera angle renders the bed enormous and foreshortens the figure so that the person appears shrunk and barely there. The photograph portrays that the human form is overcome by the trauma of psychic collapse. Here, the effect of rape is shown to be ontological erasure, the annihilation of subjectivity. The woman who we know to be there that we cannot see has been made woman, but has been altogether unmade as a subject. So I'm gonna pause it and see if I can get that picture for you. Right, so as you can see, I had to zoom in on this image quite a bit. So as you can see, I'm 300% zoomed. Like this was just me looking at the photograph in general. But as you can zoom in here, you can hardly recognize that this just looks like a pile of sheets. You know, like you wouldn't know there's a person laying in this bed unless the caption had told you this is a hate crime survivor number two. So um, yeah, I thought I'd show you that picture, just so you have an idea of the context. So uh, Aftermath 2004 portrays a woman standing. And in this scene, contrasts the collapsed figure on the hospital bed on the preceding page. The large scar that extends down the length of this woman's thigh signifies that there can be no easy moving beyond the trauma of rape. The scar is a sign of a much older wound, but serves here as an outer manifestation of her more recent physical and psychic wounding through corrective rape. The scar itself, an elongated teardrop, an opening into her body now closed, like the curled hand of the woman depicted in Hate Crime Survivor 1, serves as a metonym for her violated vagina. There is something unbearable about the positioning of this woman's, of this woman's hands. They seek to shield her, to protect her, in this instance from our gaze as much as from the traumatic memory of attack. But at the same time, they are passive, 
They are hands that speak a history of defeat. If there is a punctum here, it is not the scar, which we cannot fail to see, but the light as it catches the thumb of this woman, her curled fingers, the vulnerability of her being that is encoded in her hands. Again, I'm going to show you that picture. So here it is. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's like, how do you even put this into words? You know, just the way the hands are cradled, that's sort of this position of the hands. It's just sort of saying, like, I'm scared. That, that's the vibe I get from this. Or just sort of like, I don't want what happened or what's going to happen, presumably. But there's the scar. Obviously, very easy to see that. But I think the hands, like they're saying in the article, the hands say more than the scar does. Um, but anyway, so that's Aftermath. Muholi's hate crime series asks us to think differently about how we understand sexuality and subjectivity. And this is not restricted to thinking what lesbians are or might be. They show us that to be lesbian is not to perform desire in a way that transforms or queers an underlying essential being that is woman. Instead, they show through laying bare the painful way in which corrective rape of lesbians restores absolutely nothing at all the emptiness at the center of the fiction that animates all forms of gendered being. That's, that's rough. Like, I never heard of that before. Queer in the archive, the ways in which Antonio Canova's sculpture of the three graces might be read as pregnant with lesbian transsexual desire is surfaced in a photographic work by British artist Della Grace or Della Grant La Grace Volcano. The black and white photograph shows three women naked, but for their jack boots, standing in the pose of the three graces with their arms around one another and their heads shaved, their bodies scar scarified, pierced, and tattooed. I first saw La Grace's volcano reworking of the sculpture in Parveen Adams' book, The Emptiness of the Image, and Adams' reading of the photograph is a provocative one. For Adams, the image disturbs the conventional modes of representation of women to such an extent that she argues these women are beyond recognition. She goes on, she goes on to explain, Recognition is a process that may be looked at from two sides. Women who are not, women who are recognized as such are recognized by a rigorous template of definition. If we do not recognize in this photograph, these women, it is not because they're recognized as something else. It is rather because the structure of recognition has been suspended. What Adams draws attention to here is the way in which La Grace Volcano's photograph inaugurates a way of looking that undoes our gendered gaze. The transgressive power of the image lies in the fact that we cannot simply substitute woman for another recognizable category of being, whether that is lesbian or anything else. Adams's reading provides a way to account for the absence of La Grace Volcanoes, the Three Graces from Pollock's Virtual Feminist Museum. Her analysis of how the photograph works to suspend the structures of recognition raises the question of what it means to be positioned outside the realms of the legible. And this returns us to the significance of the archive, which as Pollock notes, is pre-selected in ways that reflect what each culture considered worth storing and remembering, skewing historical record and indeed historical writing towards the privileged, the powerful, the political, military, and religious. Vast areas of social life and huge numbers of people hardly exist, according to the archive. The archive is overdetermined by facts of class, race, gender, sexuality, and above all, power. Indeed, the archive produces these facts as much as it holds them and seeks to secure them. The archive is also, and I think this is, I think this is the sense in which Zanel Muholi employs the term, a site of struggle for legitimacy. A certain kind of entry into the archive will mark queer lives as deviant, perverse, and criminal. Another mode of entry, one that Muholi's work seeks to find, is that which will guarantee visibility within the social that is not at the same time a form of erasure. Central here is the question of what the archive itself demands. What are the conditions of entry into the archive of legibility? If the archive, if the archive is the law of what can be said, then what is the place of outlaw subjects who are not merely who are not merely beyond or outside the law, but also signify the very law, the law's very undoing? It is in a space of suspension, a kind of limit zone between recognition and invisibility that Moholi's most powerful photographs are situated. The ways in which Moholi carefully forces the boundaries of the archive's frontier is the subject of the remainder of this paper. I explore how through a process that literary theorist Ross Chambers terms genre hijacking, and that I draw on and recode here as passing, Moholi's work performs a complex negotiation of the limits and possibilities of and for queer subjectivity within representation. Morning and, and, morning and as masquerade. This is Roland Barthes. Ultimately, photography is subversive 
not when it frightens, when it repels, or even stigmatizes, but when it is pensive, when it thinks. I'm going to pause here, take a sip. There's a second punctum that Barthes identifies as he studies the photographs that move him and attempts to identify the secrets of photographic affect. That punctum is time. Photographs make visible the passage of time, and they mark our inability to halt its passage. This relation between photography and time is central to our understanding, or to understanding, how photography, and portrait photography in particular, is linked to mourning. In Camera Lucida, Barthes reads Alexander Gardner's 1865 portrait of Louis Payne, a young man who was photographed in his cell while awaiting execution for attempting to assassinate Secretary of State W.H. Seward. The photograph is handsome, as is the boy, that's the studium, but the punctum is, he's going to die. Barthes quickly comes to see that all photographs make visible are being towards death. I read at the time, I read at the same time, this will be and this has been. I observe with horror an interior future of which death is, a, is the stake. By giving the absolute past of the pose, aorist, the photograph tells me death in the future. The photographs that make up the Faces and Phases series exploit the relation between photography and mourning to great effect. All the photographs in the series are shot in black and white. Almost all the subjects face the camera, returning the viewer's gaze. Most are half-length portraits, and several depict only the head and shoulders of the subject. Each photograph is captioned with the name of the person por portrayed, the place in which they were photographed, and the date the image was taken. The uniformity of the images indicates that they form part of a single body of work. The seeming regularity of the series also serves another end. It operates as a visual sign of a shared experience of a community of being and is a common practice in photography that aims to memorialize. Moholy's artist, artist, Moholy's artist's statement for Faces and Phases overtly articulates her desire to assert Black queer presence in contemporary South Africa and frames that desire in relation to the ever-present threat of violence, both discursive and material. It is important to mark, map, and preserve our movements through visual histories for reference and posterity so that future generations will note that we were here. In her description of the work she intends the series to perform, Moholy writes, historically, portraits serve as memorable records for families and friends as evidence when someone passes. Faces expresses the persons and phases signifies the transition from one stage of sexuality or gender expression experience and experience to another. Here, Moholy uses the term passes in the sense of passed away or to die. An analysis of the work that Faces and Phases performs also reveals how passing operates in another way. Through these photographs that make visible the passing away of lesbians as a result of hate crimes and AIDS related diseases and a form of passing between fixed gendered positions. Okay, so it's a double, a double meaning there. I, when I first read passing, I thought they meant like lesbians pretending to be straight or gay people pretending to be straight in general, not just lesbians. These portraits simultaneously permit the le these lesbian lives to pass into an archive of mainstream visual representation through their hijacking of the generic conventions of memorialization. Ross Chambers has developed this idea in relation to the work of gay writers who have testified to their experiences of living with and dying of AIDS. Genre hijacking makes use of an of excuse me. Genre hijacking makes use of established generic conventions to speak what culture has deemed unspeakable. In the case of Muholi's work in South Africa, what is unspeakable is both lesbian desire and loss. Faces and faces mobilizes the conventions of memorial portrait photography to open a space for mourning and at the same time queers that space by juxtaposing images of the dead with multiple portraits of living queer subjects. The question of what is at stake in this act of passing marks the fine line between passing as a strategy of survival and mechanism that allows one to appear and passing away, becoming invisible as a queer subject through one's entry into the realm of the legible. This invisibility can be psychic, a metaphoric loss of subjectivity, and can take material form through the threat of murder that affects lesbians being everywhere in South Africa today. Maholi's artist statement draws attention to the portraits of those who have died, but at the same time positions them among the portraits of the living. Here, the presence of the dead signals the precarious position of the living, and the living remind us of the subjectivity of the dead. Phases articulates the collective pain we as a community experience due to the loss of friends and acquaintances through disease and hate crimes. Some of those who participated in this visual project have already passed away. 
It's tragic. We finally remember Buhel Nasibi, Busi Sigasa, Noziwe Sekiso, and Penny Fish. Um, I apologize, I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, but I'm going to say their names. May they rest in peace. The portraits also celebrate friends and acquaintances who hold different positions and play many different roles within Black queer communities. An actress, soccer players, a scholar, cultural activists, dancers, filmmakers, writers, photographers, human rights and gender activists, mothers, lovers, friends, sisters, brothers, daughters, and sons. Positioning the portraits of the dead among those still living implies solidarity with the dead, a community that traverses the boundary between life and death. The rhetorical force of this pairing of the living and the dead powerfully refuses the dehumanization of Black lesbians that led to the deaths of women memorialized here. This positioning, which insists on the relation between the living and the dead, also means that we necessarily read each portrait in the series as haunted by the possibility of violence, rape, and murder. The photographs in the series of women who have died, Busi Sigasa, Penny Fish, and Nozi Nos Izwe Sekiso, make use of the recognizable codes of the obituary form. But read in relation to the other portraits in the series, these codes are undeniably queer. Witness the juxtaposition of Noziwe Sekiso, Gig Gugu Lefu, Cape Town, 2008, with Gazi Tizuma, Umlazi Durban, 2010. What results is a form of queer memorializing that makes lesbian lives and deaths visible without sacrificing their queerness. It is the particular per, it is the particularity of these deaths as lesbian deaths that Muholi will not allow to pass even as they pass into the memorial structures of recognition. The photographs that make up faces and phases negotiate the line between passing and death, visibility and invisibility. For in these images, we cannot what we see is not woman, and yet we cannot recognize these subjects as lesbians either. For a moment, in looking, the fixity the fix. Itty, the fixity of our gendered look cannot hold. The structure of recognition has been suspended. All that is thought to separate Black lesbians from human subjectivity is simultaneously present and absent here. The photographs insist on the, peculi the particularity of the Black lesbians as they, por they portray at the same time as they insist on their sameness to other women, to other embodied subjects, to the human. Through these straight portraits, we bear witness to queer lives. Muholi's photographs move us through and beyond our perceptions of what lesbian subjectivity might be, and at the same time, challenge us to reconceptualize the bounds of what is thought to constitute the human. Must the passage between invisibility and visibility entail getting up queerness? In their complex defamiliarizing the conventions through which we recognize the human, the portraits that constitute faces and phases suggest this does not have to be so. Moholi's photographs claim a place for queer subjects in the field of visual art. Through this act of claiming, her work testifies to the complexity of queer experience in post-apartheid South Africa, and at the same time constitutes a demand for political recognition. Moholi's photographs, which bear witness to the experiences of lesbians who have been subject to hate crimes, as well as some of the responses her work has generated, like that of Xing Wa Na, illuminate that this demand has yet to be met. The inclusivity of the South African constitution is often the starting point for debates about gay and lesbian rights in this country. However, as many of Muholi's photographs show, to be, queer is to, be, to be queer is still to be subject to multiple and often violent forms of erasure. I'm gonna read the acknowledgements real quick. I would like to acknowledge the financial support of the National Research Foundation and of the Ford Foundation. And I would like to thank Natasha Distiller, Carolyn Hamilton, Joan Hambridge, John Higgins, and Coylin Parsons, uh, all of whom read, the pa read this paper at a very short notice and offered me suggestions and encouragement. The participants in the Archive and Public Culture Research Initiative quarterly workshops and reading group and Mona Hakimi, who provided research assistance at a critical time. The insights of the anonymous reviewers were both crit crucial and generous. Andrew van der Vlees invited the paper into being. As always, Louis Green helped me to conceptualize and write this. Alastair Douglas makes it all possible. This is for Sophie Douglas my brave wolf child. Okay, so um, references are down here. I'll stop scrolling here so you can see if there are any references that just yell out to you. There's that Griselda Pollock piece, 2007. Okay, cool. I think I'm gonna go in my paper. Ah, oh, man. Eh, I can go back and edit my discussion board, it's okay.
Okay. Um, all right. That's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, I'll stop it here. Uh, if you did make it this far, I appreciate it. If not, that's okay. Um, the whole point of these videos is to make knowledge readily accessible to people because you shouldn't have to pay all this money just to have access to this information. And I'll gladly give it to you for free because no one's paying me to read this because uh, if someone, like it is part of my job to read this. So arguably I am getting paid to do this technically, but nobody's paying me to read this article to you. I wanted to read it and make it accessible. Nobody's twisting my arm and making me do something I don't want to do. So thank you again. And I uh, hope to see you um, or I hope to create another recording and hopefully you can watch that one too. So thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful day.